I'm Don Bollinger. I uh, run the OOM, Open Optical Management um, Project for OCP. I, uh, this is going to work better than the other room over there because I can actually walk over and talk at my sites. I found the little logo today, so I slapped it on there. We've been an OOM approved project for over a year now. So uh, what I'm going to do is learn how to run this thing. Just give you an update on where we're at. OOM is alive and well. I'll explain what it is. The main point today is going to be you need a better EEPROM driver to get at the data in your optics. And I've got one. Okay. Confusing me. If you can do it without, you know, 10 minutes of messing around. Okay. It's okay, I'm still gonna have to figure out which is page up and which is page down. That's the only problem I was having. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can go full screen, you can get to that icon right over there. It's this one. You just can't see it from here. Right. It's... Yeah. There, okay, now yep. we should still be able to control it. Yep. Okay. You see, it's down. Remember that it's down, okay. So briefly, the reason we did this project, so let me start way back to the beginning. In these optical devices, in case you don't know, there is EEPROM data, data that tells you things, simple things like vendor part number, um, bandwidth of the device, live data like uh, temperature voltage, uh, laser bias for every channel, receive transmit power for every channel. Uh, you can control the device by writing to the EEPROM. You can get... Uh, proprietary special things that different vendors have by reading or writing those EEPROMs. So there's a lot of interesting information in these EEPROMs. Folks like Cisco and Juniper know this. They've built this into their operating system and it makes it work better because they know these things. Down, <laughs> down, down. Um, what we found out is in the white box space, in the OCP kind of space, Every switch has a different driver to get access to those devices. Every NOS has a different standard interface. Every one is different, which makes standard a challenge to get that data to your applications and so on, which means to write an application, you gotta know which switch and which NOS you're writing to. And the net result is we're, we as uh, optical vendors think there's a lot of useful data that isn't getting used by the customer. We wanna fix that, so we're trying to get a standardized way to get that data flowing upstream into those applications. So what we have today, there is an optical driver called Op Opto is the name we put on it. It's part of the Opto uh, OOM project. This driver is a standard Linux driver, builds against you know, everything from 3.16 up to the top of branch Linux, uses a standard I2C approaches to get at the data in there. It provides it in a standard way to the OOM decode library, which was the original OOM project. I'll explain that in a, in briefly a, in a couple of slides, but basically a Python package that allows you to get that data out. There's a JSON server, which is really just a, um, a prototype to demonstrate how it would be done. It's not really a production thing, but it allows us to run a demo over the network what your management tool might look like to, to monitor things like temperature and voltage and, and, and things like that. In fact, this actual demo is running over in the Sonic booth. Uh, by the time you get there, they'll start tearing it down, but uh, it's been running there for a couple of days. We ran the same demo last year at uh, OCP Summit, although we did not have our own driver. Um, today's demo is actually running on a box I've never run into. I've never talked to, to the driver writers for that box, but it turns out the driver just worked and everything worked, worked all the way up. Uh, I didn't even know whose box was, it was gonna be put on, it just worked. So all of this is independent of the optical vendor, independent of the switch vendor, independent of the NOS vendor. Um, it doesn't have to be my driver, but it helps a lot if it's my driver, and I'll explain why shortly, um, to get this, this data. So as an operator, um, you know, Facebook, Google, and so on, as a management software writer, 
this is, you know, this is what you're trying to do and you want a, a standard interface for that, OOM is intended to provide that. Okay, so what is OOM, the original OOM decode layer? It's a Python package to provide that standard API. It's an open uh, OCP accepted project. It re returns the EEPROM data in key value pairs. So as a Python programmer, you say, you know, get me the temperature and it comes back 30 degrees C. It doesn't come back with a two byte floating point value in 256 of a degree Celsius, which is actually the format in the module. It knows where to go, it knows how to decode it, and it gives you back a reasonable answer. Um, it understands voltages and temperatures and, and power settings and all the inner works of that EEPROM. Again, any, any NOS, any switch, any module vendor, any module type, SFP, QSFP, plus DD even. It's open source. I'll have a link at the end showing you where to get it. Here's a four, four line, in my demo it's three lines. Here's a four line program, a complete OM program. You could sit on a switch that has OM and say, use the package, get a list of ports for each port Give me the DOM data. DOM is digital optical monitoring data. This is your temperature, voltage, et cetera. And print it out. So there's the name plus the data we got out. And you'll get port zero is 3.3 .3 volts, 23 and a half degree, um, yeah, degrees. Uh, transmit power, receive power, laser bias. And you'll get that for every port, right? Four lines on any switch that runs OOM, any NOS that runs OOM, you'll get this data out about these. Okay, so the idea is it works anywhere and it's sensible, rational. I mean, it's actually you can ask for power and it get you an answer back. I'll, since I have time, any questions so far? Does that make sense? Understand what we're trying to accomplish here? Yeah. So in this way, then there will be no interoperability problems. Uh, this way, there's no interoperability problems. Uh, uh, Right. Right. So the idea is now I want to go up. It doesn't matter whose whose optics these are, as long as they adhere to the standard, we'll get the data out. It doesn't matter what switch you plug it into, because it's all working through I squared C, which is standardized. It doesn't matter what NOS you plug into. It, it, my driver works best, but there's other drivers that can access it. So if if the library understands the the driver. Yeah. So how soon this will be available? How soon will this be available? Um, the software is online now in the GitHub site and works. The decode layer largely is unchanged in the last year, so it's been available. The driver is currently available in Sonic and ONL. Um, a big part of my pitch is if you're not Sonic and ONL and you own a NOS, let me know. I'll, I'll help, you, help you get it into your NOS. We'll get to more of that. Anything else? OK, so that's what OOM is. It works great if it can read the EEPROM. So OOM depends on the driver underneath. Um, in the, about a year ago, we figured out we weren't getting access to everything we needed. So uh, we decided we're going to need to write that driver ourselves. So here's what we did. Backing up a step. This is what the data looks like inside those EEPROMs. So if you get it, it turns out this is 128 bytes of data, and the second 128 bytes is page zero. And if you don't page it, all you get is, 128, or is 256 bytes. If it's an SFP, you get 256 more, and that's it. You have to understand paging. You've got to write to that page register if you want to see page one or page two. So all of these other pages. The driver has to know that when you ask for location 5276, it's way down here on page something or other. On QSFPDD, they added yet another layer. So these pages are banked. So to get to the, to the data on channel 9, you have to get to these pages and then change the bank register to get to the second bank of registers, OK? So that's what the driver needs to understand. So when you try to access data, it knows how to get it. Many of the drivers I've seen don't page. They're based on a, a, a Linux standard driver called AT24. So what they access is just that data. 
Um, you can get some stuff, but not a lot. Down. Um, the best drivers I've seen, um, actually the best driver I've seen comes from Cumulus, which theirs is good enough for today's work. Uh, my driver is actually based on it. They get down to page three, which is as much as is specified in the standard. However, the, um, this register is eight bits, so there's another 250 pages of data available that my driver will access. Yeah. I'm not trying to say they're bad. I'm just trying to explain why we needed to do this, because there's interesting stuff down there. So, for instance, the alarm and warning thresholds, this is part of the, the demo we put together. It's red because if your temperature is above 75 C, that's bad. So I made it red. Above 70, it's okay. You know, here's the, the happy zone down to zero. All this data is on page three. So if the driver doesn't get to page three, I can't tell you the values for these things. I can give you the temperature, but I can't tell you if it's good or bad. Um, some capabilities require ability to write. So if you want to dis software disable the, um, the, the optics, you have to have a write capability, which many drivers don't have. Uh, we have some, some proprietary features that do both reach you know, as far as page 30 to do interesting things. And the big deal is we're seeing a whole lot of QSF PDD discussions, uh, 400 gig discussions, especially this week. None of that stuff is going to be available unless you can reach all the way up to page 10 or, or uh, 10 to 20 um, hex. So my driver is ready for that, works now. There's none, none of the others will work for that. So what I'm trying to do is make it available, get it deployed before QSF PDD is widely deployed so everybody's got this. See what the picture looks like when you've got all the data? This is what it looks like without the data. I can tell you the temperature, but not whether it's good or bad. We don't need to know all that. How well does your driver work? If you, if you contact me, I'm, I'm happy to look at it. It turns out I've seen a number of them. It's easy to tell once you get good at it. So here's what I built. It reads and writes. I mean, you can tell from the presentation already. It's going to read and write. It accesses all of the page. Um, it accesses SFP, which uses two I squared C addresses. It uses all 256 pages of either SFP or QSFP, QSFP DD. Um, just a technical thing that makes it a little smoother. All flavors, right? So the drivers that are available today generally work for either SFP or QSFP, but not well for both. This will work for both of them as well as DD. Platform independent, and as I said, it's available today on ONL and Sonic, on Acton, Inventec, and Quanta switches. There's specific switches that have checked into the upstream repositories to support those. Okay? If you're not on this list and you want to be, I would love to get you on this, this list. It's not difficult. Give me a call. Next step, we're going to try to go upstream to the Linux kernel. I, I admit I've not done that yet. I haven't put anything upstream, so I'm a little intimidated, but uh, should, be avail should be able to do that. It's available today here on GitHub. So all the bits are ready, the driver's there, um, and like I say, I'm happy to help answer questions, help you uh, get it ported. Actually, just build it and it runs. Okay, so I'm going to stop with my picture here, which might help answer questions. And I have to moderate my own question session. <laughs> questions, please. Somebody, anybody. There's a mic right there. Right? right? In your way. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question is like, this is a very good, interesting tool. Like, uh, but in the most of the data center application, if you see, we swap modules. Uh, several times. So how you will use this kind of tool to monitor those the history of the product? Like, let's say if I swap it five times, so will it record separately or it will rewrite the program, the data, what you are collecting? Okay, so I don't think your mic's on, so I'll, I'll, So if you swap the module, what will it do with the data? Yeah. Um, nothing at all, it doesn't have the data. So what it is, is it's an API. You ask, what's the vendor ID? And you get back an answer, and we're done. You pull the module out and put it back in. If you ask again, it'll get a new vendor ID. Mm -hmm. and but we, do if, I have the access to the previous data? Let's say it ran for three months. 
and then I Here, swapped it. It's so, not, not working, so go ahead. Uh, let's say uh, it's running for three months and then I swapped it. So do I have that? I will get the last three months data and then, okay, this day, this time I swapped and then the data after that. Okay. That's up to you. That's the management layer. I didn't write a management app, right? This is to make the data accessible to the management app. So you, what, you, what you want to do is have your management app gather that data every day, every hour, every minute. At some interval you find appropriate and suck it all up and save it away so that you can do analytics on it later. So you can decide if it changed and if that's okay so that you can say, oh, is it the right vendor? Did someone go and put the wrong parts in? Um, but that, that's a matter of the app, which we're not gonna, we haven't written, we don't plan to write because everybody wants a different app. I see. Okay. Thank you. More questions? You got a question, please? Good. I'll use this. Hey, hey Don, thank you. Um, I joined a little bit late, but what's the reason for using um, I2C to, to access the, you know, in, in your um, drawing here? What's the reason for that? Yeah. Because is, that the is that the only way? These devices are specified as I2C devices. That's the only way to actually, I mean, they're all standardized and they all use I2C to, to get to them. So the switch always has an I2C interface to get to them. And the, and the good thing for me as a driver writer is there's a very standard I2C set of drivers and interfaces in Linux. So when I put my driver in there, it just works because standard interfaces below it are working. I might want to comment about CFP and MDIO, or I might not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there is a decode library. Uh, the decode library does include CFP. Um, it, it, it expects to be able to access MDIO, but I have never met a CFP MDIO box or operating system, so I don't know what kind of drivers are in there. I'm assuming a standard Unix-like interface. Basically, we're going to use SysFS as our layer here, so if there's a driver for CFP, MDIO, that has a SysFS interface, I'm prepared to talk to it, but right now, until I actually see some hardware, it, it has, it's untested, but it's implemented. Is that what you were looking for? Yes, and we're basically focusing on things that are in, active in OCP, which are yeah. basically a pluggable I2C right. modules. Right, it's all I2C right now, and it looks like CFP is unlikely to get enough momentum to be worth it here. And QSF PDD we're aiming for because we see it coming fast. So. But the hooks are there when, if they show up. Yep. Be yep. Uh, who provides the decode library? Is it like a, for example, in this case, Finisar provides this or is it third party? So who provides? Um, <laughs> let, let me make this as complicated as I can. It's an OCP project. Yeah. It's on GitHub. Uh, anybody can contribute. So far, there's one contributor, and that's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so would that be open to, for example, if somebody uses, a, ah. let's say, another module, yep. know, would you be able yes. to use that library and use it? Yep, it yep, yep. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all consulting. Um, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, it's designed to understand the standard stuff. So as long as it's implemented the standard, for the keys we have implemented, it, it'll work. Um, it would be great to have help if, you, if there are standard keys that aren't implemented that you're interested in. We could get them in here for everybody. Um, it also is designed specifically so you can just add another file in the right place. This is all documented online how to do it. Add another key file in the right place to provide the mappings for proprietary things. So my demo actually has a separate Finisar key file for the special features that only Finisar does. And it's designed that anybody can add a key file for anything they want, so other vendors can certainly add that in. Uh, the software is very intentionally not, uh, it, it's agnostic. It's not Finisar software. It's for everybody. It's, it, I, I lose the value proposition if it doesn't work for everything. All right, so now, okay, um, I'm done. <laughs> so, uh, we'll get back to you because we'll have 40 minutes at the end. Vincent, Facebook.